I know board gamers and welcome back to Not Board Gaming. I'm your host, I'm Mark. Now, in today's video, we're going to be previewing a game which hits Kickstarter on October the 24th. The link will be in the description below. And this game is by far and away one of the best looking games I've ever seen, not only this year, but of any year. And it is the much anticipated The Old King's Crown coming to us from Eerie Idol Games. It's a game that's designed by Pablo Clark and uh, developed by Pablo and Andrew McKelvey. And it's got a solo mode designed by none other than the ubiquitous Ricky Royal, Richard Wilkins. Of course, we all know Ricky Royal from Boxer Delights. He's taught many of us how to play many games. And of course, he's done his own solo modes as well for other games, games like, um, uh, <laughs> games like of course, Pax Premier Second Edition, where you took a, a game that relied very heavily on negotiation etc and managed to make a fantastic solo mode out of it well he's done it again uh, not bearing the lead here this is one of the most beautifully realized solo modes i've seen for a game based around bidding and uh, bluffing and manipulation that there is you see right the game itself is one to four players and uh, the basic premise behind the game is that a king has died and there are four heirs to the throne and these four heirs are going to do kind of combat uh not combat they're going to uh, kind of come up against each other and there is an element of combat in it to try to become the new king and each of these four factions is wildly asymmetric as well. So you can play with, uh, as a solo gamer, play with any of the four factions and you will have a very, very different game. Now, in the multiplayer game, it relies on kind of placing cards and having a bluffing and a bidding mechanism, which of course is always difficult to do in a solo mode. However, what Ricky has managed to do along with Pablo here is create a solo mode which captures most of the core concepts of the multiplayer game and i think that's really really important you're not playing a different game you're just playing a game as a solo gamer you're playing the same game just with a few tweaks and changes in the mechanisms itself uh, and it's absolutely fantastic and we'll go over exactly how the game works in a wee while but first of all you know when we talk about the old king's crown and anybody that's seen it has already has always commented on the artwork so the game's designer pablo clark is also the artist as well and let me just show you a few of these cards that he's done here so here we go here we, i've got the the green faction uh i can't remember what they're called exactly but we've got the green faction here and the artwork is absolutely utterly stunning and pablo's done the artwork itself now the game has been in development for quite a while i first saw this at uk games expo maybe two years ago and i've been speaking to them consistently since then and what they've done is exactly the right thing they've held back they've developed the game they've polished the game uh they've had uh, the guys from leader games assist them and help them now leader games aren't involved in the publishing or the distribution of the game or the development of the game but they provided them with guidance and advice and what we come up with now or what they've come up with now is a game which just really hits the mark on so many levels so as i say We'll, we'll come on to kind of my thoughts at the back end of it. No surprise, I think it's an absolutely fantastic game with a wonderfully realised and beautifully realised solo mode with some fantastic artwork. But how does the game play? So as I say, essentially what it is, is over a number of rounds, you're going to try and vie to get the most number of uh, coins that you can get. Um, so I think it's called influence in the game. Uh, so in the first, uh, first player, either you or the uh, AI to 20 points or to 20 influence is going to uh, win the game and become the new king. Now, when we talk about the AI, say the wildly different factions, the AI also has a number of mechanisms in there or a number of abilities in there which allow you to change it very, uh, in various ways. The AI is called a simulacrum and each particular build of that AI is called an archetype and it comes with suggested archetypes in there. There's the basic one that it's going to give you for kind of when you're learning to play the game, etc. Then it gives you other variants on there that you can do, but you can also build your own archetype as well because it's got these modifier cards, which you've got a, like a unique kind of, not unique, a, a very uh, good kind of heat system on there. And the more red ones you put in there make it hotter and more difficult. The more blue ones that you put in there uh, obviously make it cooler. And you can mix and match. You can make it kind of more aggressive in certain ways and less aggressive in other ways by doing that. So you can build your own archetypes. You can go with the predefined archetypes. And you, even with those, you can then add your 
your own modifiers on there as well as adding additional numbers of companies and these these things here and I'll explain how they work in a wee while to the AI so it has more power on the board so when you come for when you when you're looking for a game that kind of allows you this ability to play different builds of AIs, to create your own builds of AIs, to make the game more difficult or easier depending on what you're wanting to achieve, then what Ricky's done here is absolutely got all of that covered for you. What Ricky and Pablo have done here has got all that covered for you. So I say over a series of rounds, uh, seasons, I suppose, or years, because you're going to play through various seasons here, you're going to try and establish the most influence. So the first one, 220, wins the game. And, you know, a game from a solo perspective, once you learn how to play the game, you can probably play it in around about 45 minutes. Now, some go longer, depending on how you work the cards and what cards come out and how the, uh, the simulacrum works against you. But right 45 to 60 minutes per game um, and while it's on the table you're going to have this beautiful beautifully just constructed artwork on here which is some of the best artwork I've ever seen in a board game it's just absolutely fantastic hats off to Pablo for creating again just a, one of the most beautiful uh, board games that I've seen in a long long time so that's kind of the overview on it um, it does come with uh, certainly if you've got the solo in there as well it comes with a couple of rule books we have the main rule book and we have a solo rule book as well how are the rule books they're excellent and i'll talk about them at the end they're both really 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 good um but i would recommend kind of going into uh, learning how to play the game multi-handed at first play a few rounds before you go into the solo but we'll come on to that uh in a wee while so without much further ado I'll take you down to the table, take you through a round of how it works and show you kind of what happens uh, and then we'll talk about my thoughts at the back end of the video. So this is the Old King's Crown coming to us from Eerie Idol Games, developed, designed by Pablo uh, Clark and developed by Pablo Clark and Andrew McKelvey with a solo mode by Ricky Royal. It's Kickstarter on the 24th of October. The link is in the description below. Right, let me show you this kind of glorious feast that your eyes is going to behold your eyes are going to behold let's go down to the table okay so here you can see that i got more or less everything set up for a solo game of the old king's crown from eerie idol games i'll go through some of the components and then we'll do a, a round of gameplay so at the top here i'll just drag this down for a second we have the main board and you can see it's got six areas on there one two three four five six each of these has a name and you're going to be bidding on these areas to try and win one of these areas because if you win them they have particular actions for example at the top here castle you gain uh, a coin or an influence and it allows you to move one card with authority on it and that's a keyword on a card uh, into the court which is this here the court will generate you some income each round here in wilderness you gain a coin and you can move one uh, one card with quest on it to uh, your site of power each faction has its own site of power that's mine that is the ai's over there we've got some fairly powerful cards in there but you've got to have enough uh, enough quest uh, enough cards with quest on there to be able to buy that card then down here in harvest field you can gain two influence and here in the battlefield you can remove two influence from a single player or uh, you can claim the collaborator and that's this thing here and what that does is at the top of each board you've got this little notch here and there's one here one of the eye boards each one has their own and they've got their own particular powers in here and you get to use that if you've got the collaborator of course the ai gets to use it for its own stuff as well in the furnace uh, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second and then down here we have the shrine which allows you to gain one coin and place up to three cards in any order on the bottom of your draw pile they must be revealed or in your hand that means they must be on the board here or in your hand you can't put them from your discard pile on there and the necropolis allows you to gain uh, an influence and shuffle your discard pile and draw up to three cards into your hand why is that important you see when you play cards generally they're going to go into your discard pile and you're going to start with a hand of six cards the ai is going to start with four however Every time you get through that deck and you shuffle it, you have to go through something called attrition. And what attrition does is it lowers your hand size by one. So suddenly you're going to be in a position where you have less cards to play. So keeping that discard pile is really, really important for you as well. Now down here, we have the Great Road and you get the opportunity to bid on the Great Road as well. 
and you choose uh, i think it's 40 or 50 cards for the great road you choose a deck of 20 and you populate the great road with them uh, and then whoever's got the highest bid on here you or the simulacrum if you do bid on this on the great road you don't have to bid on the great road you have to bid on these up here then you get to choose uh one of these kingdom cards which can give you additional powers for example the let's have a look at the gambling then we'll look at the artwork on there for starters uh this takes place in the summer phase let's say so at the beginning it takes place over kind of a number of years in the seasons of there so in the summer phase this will allow me to choose an opponent opponent's unrevealed card and name its trait each card has traits when it's revealed uh this round if the trait matches uh, gain two influence if it doesn't you must give that, that player one influence if able so that allows you to steal some and these are variant powers on there as well so there's various things that they can do so they become really powerful in helping you do that so that's kind of the main board there over here we have a number of tiles that i think you can see most of them yeah uh we have the court which as i mentioned you're going to kind of try and get your uh well, at least one of your cards on there because that will generate income for you in the uh spring depending on how many how much authority is on those cards you see authority is a keyword that's on some of the cards here we have the order track in the uh solo game the ai always starts first but that will change each round depending on who's got most influence here we have my site of power and this is say as i said earlier if i get the quest on there and get enough quest i can buy that card which gives me 13 strength on my card and that's really important and here we have the order which is the ais and they're going to try and accumulate stuff on there as well to try and get their cards into their hand so that's kind of the board itself then we have the player boards which are these here now as i mentioned these are all asymmetrical let me just zoom down and show you this so here we can see my player board and I've got it a little bit shoved up at the moment just to get everything on, but in reality you want a gap because you're going to put cards in the top. This is my Herald, and you're going to place him each and every round on the board, and that's going to dictate potentially if you win that region, so you've got three regions, each with two, um, uh, each with two areas in there. If you win that region and you choose the action where your Herald is, you get gain a coin. <laughs> if, you, if you win that region and your Herald's in that area and their Herald's in that area as well, you get to steal a coin from them as well. And these things here are called companies and they add strength to your battle when it comes to kind of, um, uh, when it comes to resolving where your cards are. Uh, and they are, <laughs> you start the game with five of them. Every time you use one they're going to the reserve the only way to get them back is by um uh, is by getting rid of cards or putting cards in the lost pile if you like yeah then down here you have your tactics and say each uh, faction has its own uh its own kind of um uh, collaborator actions and it also has its own factions down here as uh, its own tactics down here now bear in mind this is a prototype copy and unfortunately on the prototype copy one of these just doesn't fit ever so slightly there's about a millimeter left on it but it's a really good prototype copy and what happens is you get to use these at the various stages this one can be used in spring that one in summer that one in autumn and that one at the end of the year and then when you've used them you will turn them over okay now this one uh it starts off and it gives you two strength uh, additional strength in any region when you turn it over it gives you four strength in any, any region in any particular region then you burn that tactic however this one once you've used it and most of the others when you use them have got this on here so you're either going to pay two strength from your cards or, or two uh two quests from your cards or in the spring phase you can move three companies into your reserve to reinstate that tactic so you get to refresh it if you if you spend what's on there those tactics become really powerful the timing of use of those tactics is really really powerful now say so over here on this particular faction we got the what the collaborator does and this says in the spring i can add a card from my hand face up to a region and this card is now revealed and will contribute to the strength for the first clash in the region you see when you unveil the cards you're going to have clashes on there uh, but i can only do that if i've got the collaborator and i choose to use it okay so winning that collaborator fairly early can be a good thing down here is space for your kingdom cards if you when you take a kingdom card you're going to put it on there Put the card that you want it with underneath it that's the strength of it and that gives you that power however <laughs> both you and the ai will have the opportunity to steal each other's kingdom cards as well finally thing to speak about from your perspective is your deck so you're going to start with a deck of cards let me just zoom back out again 
So we have your deck of cards. Now we're going to start off, and these two cards start off in your hand, okay? So you have um, the uh, this card with that kind of the crown symbol that's got strength of ten, and then we have the ruse, which is the jester card, okay? So this is kind of when you want to play a card, and you maybe know you're not going to win an area, uh, then you can play this card and still potentially uh, not lose it. However, uh, it's got a strength of zero, and it can always be returned into your hand because it's got the loyal. Uh, uh, the loyal keyword um, and the opponent can't get rid of it can't put it in your discard and can't destroy the card at all put it in the lost pile and here we have the 10 power card which is loyal so this can come back into your hand as well and it's resilient as well uh, and that's 10 so this start off in your hand and then you're going to draw up to your hand size which is one two three four uh, so I got four here plus two there that gives me my six hand size and these are my cards I can use on my particular turn here uh, and you can see they've got various keywords on there we have authority in quest and that's for the court and that's for uh, the site of power uh, we have bolster which strengthens the cards either side of it uh, pathfinder and quest uh, and we have deploy which can be really powerful because if you keep that card until the next round you can put it face down basically and then that adds to the strength on there as well and each card just look at the artwork on these it's utterly stunning i say in each faction has got its own unique set of cards as well and the balance seems really really good in the game so that's kind of how your starting hand works there and that's there let's talk about the ai let's move over to the ai so the simulacrum has got its own set of cards and that's these cards here uh, and these have various strength modifiers on there that is the weakest card <laughs> that's a fog card i'll talk about those in a second that's the middle card and then there'll be a gold card somewhere as well which is this one here which is the uh, the strongest card in its hand the fog cards are actually stronger and they have various powers and and strengths on them and they will do various things with their keywords etc um, and it's also got this card as well so unless you eliminate it this will always come back into its hand at the end of the uh, at the end of the round basically end of the year and that's a step 10 card so that's going to come into its hand if you're not eliminated you've got a good chance that you know that's going to be coming out uh, at some point uh, and you can see its hand size is four it can lose its hand size uh, but generally its hand size is always going to be four it's very difficult to make it go down through its hand size it's, it's got its herald and i'll explain how that works in a second and it's got its various companies here now i've got it with three companies you can have any number of companies Companies in there that you want of course the more companies it's got the stronger it is because it's going to put those companies out onto the board so how does it know what to do then because you're going to be kind of bleeding and, and trying to win areas well you've got these two set of cards down here you've got the maneuver card and the resolution card the maneuver card is what you turn over first and that's going to state where the herald is going to go okay uh, and then you've got the resolution card and that's going to state where its cards are going to go and where its company is going to go uh, and uh, so therefore you will never know what card is going to go where you've got an idea because of the strength of the cards but you'll never fully know what card is going to go where and it also adds into its uh, hand uh, three well to start off with the um uh, the basic one adds three random fog cards now these cards go into its deck not into its hand into its deck and these are particularly powerful cards because what they've got on here is they've got a basic action but also if um, the, the kind of keywords align on this card here uh, to what's on there so if it lines on the resolution card to what's on there it will also do this special action down here as well and you can see these cards run from various uh there we go we've got a 10 one in there we've got a non one in there and they've all got various things in there some of those will get added into its deck throughout the game as well but it's going to start off with the basic simulacrum with three random ones with the more difficult simulacrums or the more tailored ones you get to choose the cards or the cards are prescribed for you which ones are going to hand in there and they're particularly nasty when they come out because you know generally you're going to lose against those so this dictates uh kind of where its herald's going to go that dictates where the strength of the cards is going to go and also where its company is going to go and then there's a tiebreaker on there if it's stealing cards or taking cards from the kingdom road and that's kind of the overview on all of the components that are here i think the only other thing to show you that's the player token are these here so you get to if you're last in the order like i am at the moment then i would get to choose in which order the cards are turned over when it comes to revealing for the clash uh, 
phase of it. Now that's really, really important because you may have a bolster card that you want to unveil first because that will then bolster the strength of other cards around it. Uh, or you may have a card that you want to unveil last. However, if the uh, simulacrum is in second place, it chooses where to go based on some of the information on these cards. And we may well get to that. Now, if you really want to learn how to play the game, bear in mind this is a really brief overview then go and check out ricky royal's channel he's got a series of playthroughs on this on the solo mode uh and you know you can really learn the base uh, the, the really learn how to play the game so that's kind of an overview on components what we'll do is we'll run through a year and that should give you a good indication of exactly how the old king's crown from eerie idol games works Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to follow the solo mode reference. Okay, so here's the solo uh, rule, uh, the solo rule book, and on the back of it is a reference on exactly how it starts. Okay, so at the start of the year, you're going to draw cards, and uh, you draw your cards. Simulacrum doesn't draw theirs at this start, at this point, and you're going to determine the order, and the player who's got the most coins will go first. Now at the start of the game, nobody's got any coins, so it will be the simulacrum who will always go first. So I'm going to draw cards into my hand. So we know we've got these two cards that you start with here. And we'll draw one, two, three, four. We know what the cards are because we saw them earlier. Then we move on to the spring phase, okay? So the simulacrum is going first, so we come down here. First thing it would do is activate the collaborator. It doesn't have the collaborator at this stage. Uh, that's this, this thing up here. If it does have it, it would activate its furnace card. Here we go. Uh, and I would get to have to choose two of these here. So it would gain an influence, uh, or it would place an influence on the speaker, or on the rider, uh, or it would discard the top two cards of my draw pile. So it's got a way of actually making you go through that. So it's got the collaborator, it would do that, that overrides whichever um, player board you use for it. It doesn't have that. It would pillage. If it's got any pillaging cards on the map, it resolves them. So pillaging, some of your cards you can pillage, you can place them on on the board, uh, that you, they can become pillaging cards. You can place them on the board, it means nobody can place a herald on there, but they also generate income as well. If you lose the round or if you lose that region, then that pillaging card is gone. It doesn't have any here. And then we're gonna place its herald. So we're going to look at the first of these um, uh, these maneuver cards. So you draw these in spring when it's a simulacrum's turn, okay? So it, can say, it says here that the uh, the Herald is going to go into the Harvest Field. This tells me if a fog card comes out where it's going to be placed, and I'll explain that in a second. And this is about when it picks from the um, uh, from the Great Road. So the only thing we need to worry about at this stage is placing the Herald. It's going in the Harvest Field. So we take its Herald and we place it in the Harvest Field. So that's gone up there. Now, it's my turn now, and I get to activate, uh, sorry, I get to place my Herald and also activate any spring actions that I want to. Okay, so at this stage, I'm thinking I want to get into the court because I want to start generating some income. Okay, so I'm going to place it up at the castle. Now, do I have any spring actions I can activate? The only one I have is this one down here. Okay, and it will allow me to choose a region and add two strength to the first clash in that region. How would I do that? I wouldn't do it by my, um, by my um, uh, companies at this stage. I would use one of these tokens, but I'm not going to do that just yet, I don't think. Okay, so that's the spring section done. So you play, you... Uh, you kind of, uh, you place your Herald and you take out any, sp or you carry out any spring actions that are available. The only one available to the, um, uh, to the simulacrum in the early game, <laughs> there aren't any, but there could be, uh, it would be the Furnace. So if it had the Collaborator or if its uh, speaker was on the court, it would start generation income from what's on there. So then we move into the summer, which is about play placing cards. So it's the simulacrum who's the active player. It draws cards, adds them to any cards in its play area and then it shuffles them and if it draws a deploy card which uh, yeah it's a different thing it would then put that to one side and carry on drawing so we know the simulacrum has got one card which is this one here we're gonna have three more cards onto it one <laughs> fog card two and three it says to shuffle them but, but these are all four different sizes here now the reason you would shuffle them is if you had a number of the same kind of um, uh, the same kind of icons on there. And then you're going to put them in an order. And the order is, you start off with a fog card being first, 
then a gold card, then a half moon card, uh, then the uh, the least one, and then any other fog cards behind it. When I say that, it's one fog card first, then any gold, any half moon, any small moons and then any other fog cards behind it basically so it gets the chance to place that one first and that's what it's got in its hand right now so these are the four cards that it's got i only know what one of those cards is the gold one so where does it place them and this is where we have a look at this particular card here okay so you can see here you've got an order of where it's going to place that's a priority area there and look that also with this one here this symbol here means it's going to place its um its companies there as well. So it's really gonna go for that middle section where it's actually put its herald. That's kind of, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's uh, that's kind of scary. So it would, place, it would normally place its first one there, its second one on the bottom sec on the bottom region, and its third one in the top. However, it's got a fog card, remember, okay? So if you look down here at this symbol here, it says the fog card is going to go in this area number two and you look at these here so it's going to go in number two so the fog card is actually going to go to that middle region so if you look here we're going to we know the fog cards on top we're going to place that there that's gone one okay then we're going to go to place this in number two, in the next highest area okay which is down at the bottom so the gold cards going there Number three is obviously the top one, so it's half moon one up there. And then down here, it's going to play its uh, its least powerful card down there, basically against the Great Road. So I've got a chance of being first across the post on the Great Road. Okay, it's also going to place its heralds, sorry, its companies, and it's going to place them in this region here. So we know that it's got an additional strength of three, and it's played a fog card, which can be really really powerful now any regions that it wins it doesn't win what's printed on the board like you do it wins what's printed on these cards here okay and that is obviously <laughs> changes uh, depending on which card you, you pull out so we know where it's kind of it's really gunning for that middle area so i'm going to look at my cards and think right what do i want to do okay so i potentially want to have something that i can put into the court so i can win the court area which gives me the castle up there so i'm going to play my strongest card and i like to play some face down it doesn't really matter uh for the solo game whether yours are face down it matters of course whether there's a face down here <laughs> I know I haven't really got a chance of winning that, okay? So I'm gonna play my ruse card there just to play, play a card. Uh, I haven't really got a chance of winning that. This down here, it's got a gold card, which is fairly strong. Um, actually, no, I'm actually going to play a bolster card on that. Uh, so I'm gonna play my number four. I won't win on here, but it's got bolster. And I get to choose the uh, the clash order, if you like. And this has got bolster, which is giving an additional two strength to cards above and below it when they're really, uh, revealed. Okay, so we're going to put that there. And then down at the bottom, I want a decent chance of winning that bottom one. Um, uh, do I? Do I? Uh, I want it for the goal, uh, for the influence. Um, so let's place this eight card down here. Okay. And then down on the Great Road, he's put his weakest card down there. Um, now I'm gonna change that actually for a nine and play this eight down here because I wanna keep this deploy card, okay? Because you get to deploy uh, and put that against something for the next round, okay? So that's kind of what we've done there. We look here, we've uh, drawn his cards they're on the simulacrums card should i say or yeah or he or she or they uh, organized priority we place the cards we place their companies and uh we're now onto mine i've placed my cards i could take a spring action i haven't placed my companies yet i know because the the opening order unless that card gets eliminated uh, I've got a good chance of winning that top one, but I'm still going to place two companies on there uh, because that gives me an additional strength of two. So that is the summer phase done. Okay, so now we move on to the awesome phase, which is about uh, res uh, placing resolution markers and resolving these clashes. Now, I'm last on the order track, so I can place them in whichever order I want to go. I know I want to place, I want to open this one first. Then we may as well get it out of the way. We'll do that one and then that one. So I'm gonna reveal the clashes one, two, and three because that's got a bolster on it. So that's what we do there. And then what we will do is, Simulacrum, by the way, was, um, uh, was uh, 
uh, was last on the order track, what they would do is they would do the reverse order of this. So they place one there, uh, two would still go there, and then three would go there. But they're not. I'm last, so I get to choose that on there. So let's move down to the board, and I'll show you how clashes work. Okay, so we're got all the cards laid out. Now we're going to reveal these cards. And generally what's going to happen is you're going to reveal the cards, have a look at the keywords on there, see if they have any effect. Then you're going to, whoever's got the highest number in there is going to win. I've got a sneaking suspicion that this one is going to win here. So we know that mine is a four and it's got Bolster, it's got Pathfinder and it's got Quest 2. And here, Simulacrum has got 10. Now, we're going to check this word out here as well, Warmongering, and see what card is on its resolution card. Uh, what, what what the keyword is on there. So that's got warmongering on that card, and this has got Highland, so it won't do its special action. Okay, so then we look here, and it's got resilient. Great. So if the uh, simulacrum wins a clash, the simulacrum places this card on an available location in this region. This card gains pillage. Great, so we've got a pillage card to do. Okay, fine. So there's no eliminate on there at all. I've got Bolster, Pathfinder, and Quest 2. I have definitely lost this region, okay? So what we do is we then look on here and we see what it's won, okay? So it's the middle one, it's one here, and it says, uh, if the simulacrum is ahead, uh, or the player has 0 to 1, uh, then the simulacrum will get three influence, okay? Which is great, okay? So that's gonna start off with three influence. Losing influence this early on is not great. Okay, so there we go. It's also won a clash in a region where uh, it's got its herald. Uh, and for that, it's going to get yet another uh, another uh, influence. So let's start off on round one with four influence. Uh, and then what we look here is it says uh, in this here, uh, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, we put this now on an available region in this location and it gains pillage. So there we go. It's gained pillage. Brilliant. Fantastic. What it didn't do is gain the collaborator at this stage, which is really fortunate for me. Um, so that collaborator is still there. That doesn't give it the furnace power. The card will have to dictate that it gets the collaborator. So that's clash number one done. And you can see that I got absolutely trounced there and it's also got pillage in there as well. So that's gonna move that around the board and it's gonna generate income. It also means I can't place my Herald on wherever that is next go. Okay, so let's do this top one now, which I know what I want to do. So mine is a 10, which is great, okay? So I've got 10, 11, 12 up there because of course I've got those companies plus a bolster of two, which means I've got 14 up there. So I should win this up here. The collaborator has got seven, okay? Uh, and it's got authority one and quest two, so it's not going to try and eliminate my card, which is which is good. So I've definitely won that area. So I'm going to gain one coin. There we go. And because I'm choosing the action where my herald is, I'm going to gain another coin from that. Uh, and it allows me to move one card with authority uh, into the court. Now... I made a boo-boo. I didn't have a card with authority on here. So that is where the timing and the placement of your cards is really, really, really important. Important. Had I had this card with one that said authority on there, I would have been able to move it into the court and start to generate income. I didn't. And that's why the timing of when you open these is really, really, really important for you. Um, and that's why, you know, getting this ability can be a real bonus for you when you're in final place. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, because I did not have a card revealed, I can't put a card in the court, I cannot claim that court. And if I'd got that court in the spring phase, for every authority that was on there, every card that had authority on there that had a number next to it, I would claim gain two income. It didn't happen. However, I did win this up here, so I won that particular clash up there, I gained my one, and I didn't get the power from it. Ah. Oh. That is, oh, actually, yeah. So let's wind this back a little bit, okay? I'm not gonna take the action where the castle is, where my herald is. I'm actually gonna take this action here, which allows me to move one card with quest to my site of power, okay? This card must be revealed or from my hand. So this has got quest two on it, okay? So I'm gonna put this on my site of power. 
not the card I wanted to play. I've now got two near that three, so as soon as I put another one in there, I've got a quest of one or more, I'll be able to claim that card, which has got 13 strength, and put it into my hand. So although I couldn't claim what I got, I managed to claim the other one on there, and you can choose any of those in that region, but if you choose the one where the Herald is, uh, then you get the coin for it. So, I, uh, yeah, I get my one coin from there. So he's on four, I'm on one. So let's move down to the third one to be revealed here now, which is this one here. So I got a strength of nine. He's got a gold card. Let's see what that says. Okay, oh, it's his 10, okay. And that's uh, loyal and resilient. And I got authority and quest. So I didn't win that one either, which is a real shame. So we go revert back to this here and have a look at the bottom here, this bottom action, and it says, the simulacrum gains two influence. And then we add a new fog card face down to the top of the draw pile. Great. So they're on six now. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's a terrible start for me. There we go. And we're going to add a fog card up here as well. There we go. Great. So that's the main board one. Didn't really work out in my favour there. I only won one region. Uh, and I didn't play my cards right, so I didn't get to kind of uh, <laughs> do the um, uh, do the court, but I did get something onto my site of power, so that's good. So now we move down onto the great road here. And what you're looking at here is whoever's got the highest number will effectively choose uh, first on here, and then whoever's got next number down will then choose, uh, choose the next number. If there's a zero down here, you don't get to participate. I put an eight here. They put... A six, so I get to choose first, okay? So uh, there's no keywords on there that allow to eliminate, none down there, so I get to choose first. And let's have a look. Here we go. Let's choose this, because this is quite powerful now for me. Your cards with one with authority gain plus one authority. Your guards without authority gain the key th keyword authority one. That means all my cards have got authority, which is really, really good. That means that that goes in there and the card I used for it is going to slide under that. Why is that important? Well, that's got a strength of eight. At some point, I just zoom out. There we go. That's slid under there. So the card has gone there. And my card that I used to win it has gone underneath it. So it slid underneath it and that's got a strength of eight. That's important because at some point when I've got two cards, the simulacrum is going to try and steal cards from me. And it has to try and steal them with a higher value than that. So now we move on to the simulacrum and what's it going to do? Well, this is where we look at these, this card. Okay. And this is where these come in here. All right. So what it's going to do, um, it's going to try to choose the right card for it, okay? So if we look here, we've got the number one, it's gonna choose, try and choose the first uh, diamond that's on there, and you're gonna use this arrow at the bottom that's furthest to the left, okay? So what have we got here? We don't have, no, we've got, they're all these cards, okay? So they're all this with this like door symbol on there. So there's none of these here. So you're gonna choose the one that's furthest to the left, which is this card here, okay? That doesn't do massive amounts for it, okay? Uh, in terms of it doesn't get to activate the abilities that goes onto its, uh, onto its sheet as it does on mine and slides underneath. However, it does have, uh, it will do something. So if it gained one with a diamond on there, it would gain one influence. If it gained one with a person on there, it would put one influence on the speaker. And uh, here we go, it gained one here, so it puts one on the rider. So that will go up to the rider, which is over here. And what does the rider do? Well, let's go over to the rider. Here we've got the rider with one influence on there, okay? Oh, and it says here, it says, the rider never leaves its sight of power, so it's always on there. Uh, and it treats each influence as one quest. Whenever one is placed on there, the rider will check. If there is enough quest to pay for a card on the side of power, it will do so, activating that side and moving the, uh, the card to the top of its draw pile. So we know it needs three to activate that card that's up there. Uh, as soon as it's got three of those on there, that will go to the top of its draw pile. It's got a very, 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 um, a very um, powerful card in its hand. 
if it got the court, if it won the court at any point, okay, it would put influence on there. Then each spring, it would gain the amount of influence that's on, the same amount of influence that's on there. That can be quite powerful in terms of income generation for it as well. That's kind of how the rider works. So it's taken its kingdom card, it's got its power, uh, and uh, we know that it's kind of trouncing me so far. Yeah. Now bear in mind, I do have tactics as well for summer and autumn. I could have, at the summer, before I unveiled the cards, I could have chosen an opponent position and swapped two of their unrevealed cards, so I could have moved these cards around. Uh, and in the autumn, after a clash is resolved as a tie, where you were a tied player, I could immediately win the clash. See, if you tie, if you both get the same power, you then get to reveal another card from your hand, or it will draw from the top of its pile, and whoever's the strongest there will then win. However, that one would have allowed me to do it. None of those actions made any sense for me to do that right now. So that's the end of the kind of the winter phase. So we've gone through start of year, spring, summer, autumn and winter which is the um uh, which is the great road here sorry to refresh the great road what you would do is you move everything to the right and unveil the next cards now if no cards are taken from the great road what would happen is you put that to the bottom of the pile slide everything to the right and do that then we go to the end of year so what it's going to do is it's going to discard its current uh, maneuver and resolution cards it's going to revert, return its herald with all its companies. Well, I've already put the companies back on there, so its herald's going to come back here. Okay. And it's going to move any cards that have loyal on there into its play area. So we'll look at these here. Okay. So we look here. That one's got loyal on it, so that goes back into its play area. That one's got not got loyal, so that goes into its discard over there. Uh, and for me, I'm going to move my Herald back to my board. These two companies that I used, they go into my reserve now. So I have to, <laughs> have to get rid of a card to get, get them back. We'll take these off the board here. Okay, so they're not there. I get to pull my cards back that I've used. Okay. Uh, and I think there's only that loyal one there that has... Um, here we go, get into this count. There's only the loyal one there that I can take back into my hand. Goes back into my hand here. That's my start for the next round there. Um, and that's it. That's round one done. Then you would move back into round two and you'd go through all that again, <laughs> trying to maximize your cards, trying to play very cleverly, trying to understand what the simulacrum is going to do. You're going to try and get up to 20 influence. First across a post at 20 influence at the end of that year, that's it, they become the winner. If you both across the post, 20 influence in the same year, then it's whoever's got the most, uh, the most influence out of those two that wins. <laughs> and that is a really brief rundown of how you play the old King's Crown solo. Okay, so I hope that gave you a brief overview on how you play the Old King's Crown solo. Now, there are lots of nuances I haven't covered, lots of keywords I haven't covered, things like elimination, things like pathfinder, uh, talk briefly about quest, etc., and, uh, uh, and authority. But the key thing about this game is it's ever-changing state. It's all about the cards that you've got in your hand. Your hand is, is, you know, your deck is fixed. Your deck is fixed. I mean, Akram's deck will change with fog cards, but your deck is fixed. So it's getting to understand how each faction works and kind of anticipating what potential cards the simulacrum is going to put on the board. Look, I think when it comes to um, creating a solo version of a game, that is based on bluffing, that is based on um, kind of manipulating what you do and how you can do it. It's very, very difficult. And what Ricky and Pablo have managed to do here is create it in such a way that you are playing 90% of the same game as you are with multiplayer, but it's got its own set of unique challenges. And understanding how those cards work and understanding how that simulacrum works, adding these modifiers here in here, adding in different companies, creating your own archetypes or using your own uh, different the prescribed archetypes can create a massively, massively different game. And I feel like 
like I know I played my cards face down that's purely thematic you could play yours face up and then just flip theirs over I just like the whole kind of process of kind of revealing them both at the same time I have a terrible memory and sometimes I can't even remember what cards I placed down there as well um, but there's a real kind of tension as you're turning those cards cards over for the for the clash and thinking man if I'd have played one more company or if I'd have played the bolster in the right place or if I'd have played an authority card in the right place then maybe maybe I'd be in a position where I was winning now the use of the tactics is apps and when you use them it's absolutely critical in this game as well yes you have the ability to get them back and to refresh them it costs you though and it can cost you big if you don't do it at the right time as well um, and then the ever-changing abilities that happen on the great road really really kind of again make sure that each and every game just plays wildly wildly different i'm in the position now with <laughs> with two uh, company on the standard simulacrum or the standard archetype i can win with three i've got a kind of i don't know maybe 30 percent uh, ratio and then i've tried some of the other archetypes and added some of these modifier cards as well which make a massive massive difference as i say creating a solo version of a game based on bluffing based on blind bidding is exceptionally difficult not only as Ricky and Pablo managed to do that. They've managed to do it in such a way that it's one of the most beautifully realized solo modes for a <laughs> for a game of this type that I've seen. It just works on every single level. It provides you with that element of challenge, that element of you know not knowing what's coming out on the deck. And when you start adding those fog cards in there, it creates this real unknown quantity with an element of kind of knowing what's in there as well because you will know the simulacrum deck after a while after you've played it a few, a few times so you'll have a, an inkling of what that card may or may not be just like you would with another player but what it's going to do is create that uncertainty by having the fog cards in there as well and also these modifiers which change how it's played uh, and also trying to steal when it steals those kingdom, uh, those great road cards from you, uh, you may rely on one of those as a game-winning strategy for you, and it gets to a position and it's stolen it from you. You think, oh, for crying out loud, that was that was it, just like a real player would do. Look, does it mimic another player? No, not quite, obviously it doesn't, because another player will either be better, worse, or the same level than you. Uh, and, you know, the simulacrum um, may operate in a suboptimal way, based on what the cards come out in here, may operate in a completely optimal way, based on how the cards come out in here. Um, so it's not totally there, um, because you can't get to learn its, uh, totally learn its play style, but it gives you an indication, and that's what you need from a solo mode in a game like this. You just don't want total look. What you've got here is an element of deduction and thinking and understanding how the signal lacrum is playing and then you have an idea of what you can do to beat it it's an absolute bloody masterstroke i think it's, it, it works so well it's so beautifully realized for a beautifully realized game it's certainly the solo mode that the game deserves I think that's really, really important. Yes, there's an element of overhead in here. Uh, it's not massive, but it may be too much for some. Uh, and, and again, that's okay. Some people don't like, you know, massive amounts of overhead. Getting used to the keywords uh, and how they work with the simulacrum and how they work with you also potentially takes some getting used to. But once you get into that flow, you start to understand the game turns can happen relatively quickly, and that's really, really good. Now... I said at the beginning I'd talk about the rule book. So I've got the two rule books here. There's the main rule book and there is the solo rule book. Look, these are really, really well written and a lot of how this game plays goes from the comes from the fact that they've taken their time in development and I think it's really really important uh, you know they haven't rushed this to get it out to Kickstarter I've known about it for a good couple of years now it's been you know leader games have, have, have given their input as well Rick has been involved with the solo mode they've really taken their time in making sure everything is absolutely where it needs to be. I have played this at multiplayer. I played it, uh, played it at UK Games Expo multiplayer. I'll be playing it at, Gen at uh, Gridcon multiplayer as well. And it is fantastic. There's this kind of <laughs> slightly um, uh, yeah, uh, Machiavellian, Machiavellian element to it as you're trying to usurp the other player's moves, etc. And that is yeah kind of uh kind of mimicked in the solo game not 100 percent, but kind of mimicked in the solo game but the two rule books so you got the, the rule book which teaches you how to play the game which has got 
all of the information in there as well. They're really well structured. You may play kind of half a game and realize you've got a couple of rules wrong, but that's kind of the same with a lot of heavier type games that you play anyway. But everything is in there, really well structured, lots of illustrations, lots of pictures, taking you through the flow of everything. Then we've got the solo rule book. I recommend in here that you know how to play the two-player game. And I would absolutely say that. Because I'd played it before and I'd demoed it before, etc., I jumped straight into the solo version. It did take me a game or so to kind of get to grips with it, but you've got to understand the functions of the game before you move into solo. So if you do get it, then play it two-handed. Uh, maybe I play half a game two-handed just to understand how the game mechanisms work. I know you're not going to have the bluffing uh, uh, going on there, but at least you get to understand how the mechanisms work, then you can jump into the solo. Do know they're working on a walkthrough as well for a round and a half. So that's going to take you through a first round and a half of the game and then leave you to it for the solo as well, which I think is absolutely fantastic as well because I think what they're doing here is they're completely wrapping their arms around the solo community. It was always in their mind that they wanted this game to have a fully working solo mode. By crikey, they've bloody well done it. Now, as it gets to the back of the solo, uh, of the, uh, solo rulebook as well, tells you all about the archetypes and it gives you some prescribed archetypes there then what to do to build your own archetype so as i say the level of variability that you've got here to mix and match elements of the game to make it work to your solo style to try different challenges or different challenging aspects is really really good it feels like no stone has been unturned in this solo mode it's you know i previewed quite a few games and I've had my eye on this for quite a while and been speaking to them for quite a while. And I was eagerly waiting the kind of what was going to happen with the solo mode. When I knew Ricky was going to be involved with it, I knew it was going to be good because... Well, I hoped it was going to be good because a game like Pax Premier, the solo in Pax Premier, really works for a complex game, which has, you know, not all the same... It's not the same game, but it has some similar DNA in there. And, uh, and I really wasn't disappointed. This is an outstanding game with an outstanding solo mode. And I would be very, very surprised if this is not in a lot of people's top 10 lists for 2024 when it's released, presuming, uh, when, it comes, uh, when it gets issued to backers, presuming it, uh, it comes out in time. So yeah, it's, it's absolutely outstanding. I love everything about this game. I cannot stop playing this game. Um, and I've played with various archetypes and, and, and what have you. And I, you know, I quite often can get my butt kicked um, but sometimes I do win as well and it's not down to luck it's down to working out strategy managing that strategy trying to make it work on a almost on a turn by turn basis but it becomes a gain strategy once you start you know thinking about right I'm going to hold back my tactics until late game or I'm going to definitely go for this particular kingdom card because I know that's going to help me. And it, it just creates this wonderful thought space for you, this decision space for you that is so satisfying when you pull off those moves and you just think, yes, I've done it. Equally heart-wrenching as well when you realise that the card that you put there with the companies that you put there has been completely usurped by the card that was put there by the simulacrum because it's got eliminate on there and it's eliminated your card out of it and that's it it's lost because when your cards get eliminated they go to a lost pile not your discard they're gone that's it certain things that you can do to pull them back and certain uh, actions uh, that may come out on the great road etc that pull them back from there uh, but in reality when a card goes to the lost pile it's gone and that is equally kind of exhilarating in a way that obviously you know not pulling off the, uh, pulling off the move is but in a completely different way it's just absolutely fantastic if the idea of this kind of game with this uh, just harking about that artwork again with this fantastic artwork but the idea of this type of game has eluded you as a solo gamer for a long time then this could definitely be the game that makes you think differently i'm hoping that other people and other publishers and designers that see how an effective solo mode can be implemented into a blind bidding or a bluffing game. Take note of what's happened here with what Ricky and Pablo have done. It's a master, it's a, it's a master stroke. It works so, so well. And from a solo perspective, I, I just can't recommend it highly enough. So 
Thank you for joining me on this journey through the Old King's Crown from Eerie Idol Games, uh, designed by Pablo Clark and developed by Pablo and Andrew McKelvey, and with a solo mode by uh, Ricky Royal and Pablo Clark. Look, it's utterly astounding. Everything, the production quality, bear in mind, this is a prototype. The production quality that so far is fantastic. The artwork, some of the best I've seen in any game. The exhilarating gameplay with manageable overhead and variant uh, AI is just utterly fantastic. I can't recommend the um, uh, the Old King's Crown enough. It's just, you know, it's going to be probably, <laughs> certainly in my top three, four games of next year, I should imagine, uh, if not number one. Who knows? We'll see what happens next year with some of the exciting releases that are coming out. So thank you very much for joining me on this journey. Um, yeah, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Check out our other videos. Uh, and one final thought. If you can't find anyone else to play with, then there's nothing wrong with playing with yourselves. Until next time, bye-bye.